This week in Pure Reinvention. And I think in that moment, it was like, oh my gosh, this is so much larger than just getting people to code. These are just young girls who want to know that they're okay. Episode 151, Marlon Williams, Diversity and Inclusion, Entrepreneur in Residence, Tech Town, Detroit. Engage, disrupt, adapt, repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious people. Jody Marlin Williams completely defines what reinvention is all about. In this upcoming podcast, you'll hear her talk more about her own personal journey and how she was at a point where many of us from the outside would have defined her as highly successful based on things we could see, like her job title and her employer. And yet Marlin will tell you she wasn't happy. She wasn't happy with any of it. And one day she said, what what the hell am I doing? And she's going to use the word life sabbatical, which I just love. She took a life sabbatical. And in this podcast, you'll learn more about what she has done since that point in time, since she pivoted. Listen particularly for the life balance, and uh, we'll be right back. This week's episode is sponsored by Willpower Consulting. Whether it be pursuing new avenues in content delivery like podcasts, or developing a sustainable content building strategy, Willpower Consulting is with you every step of the way. Get a dose of willpower at williamrcarlson.com or at williamrcarlson on Twitter. This is a really fun podcast today because I find a sitting across the table from a kindred soul. We're here with Marlon Williams. Marlon has a extensive background, which our podcast listeners will be really, really interested to hear about. Uh, Marlon, before we get started, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. First question of the five steps in the reinvention process, which step do you most closely associate yourself with? 1,000% I am a disruptor. 1,000%. Yes. Number two, what is your superpower? My superpower is empowerment. And three, uh, as a disruptor, there are times when you've found yourself uncomfortable. Yes. Can you name a situation most recently when you found yourself uncomfortable? Probably. I had to speak at Microsoft Corporation. Oh, how cool. And Yeah. So I'm in Seattle, and there are 150 young girls listening to me about my life in technology and how they also be- could become coders. And it was really interesting because afterwards, I think it hit me that... It wasn't so much about um, empowering them to code. It was about teaching them to love themselves. And I think in that moment, it was like, oh, my gosh, this is so much larger than just getting people to code. These are just young girls who want to know that they're okay. So, so Marlon, you said that uh, of the five steps to reinvention, you are a disruptor. Yes, and I would agree for the most part in the development of your career and the success that you've had, you've been disruptive of a current pattern to create a new pattern and and the success that you've had certainly warrants the importance of disrupt. Today you find your role at Tech Town to almost be in that of a connector to though, which is step four in the reinvention process, which True. is helping people um taking people in this open door policy, right? And whatever they share with you, and then you have to do something with that. Yes. As a leader today Talk about the importance of learning how to connect and by connecting people who walk in your door, I would assume that means you have to be fairly well connected so you can put different things together. What does yes. that look like? Um, yeah, you're, you're hundred percent correct. I mean, so yeah, I guess I, I am a connector. So, you know, at Tech Town, um, I receive a hodgepodge of phone calls, emails, or just people who kind of show up and want to talk. And so I... Which, by the way, you are encouraging every one of those. Yes, yes. There are people who come in. So at Tech Town, you think about Tech Town is not really for the person who just has, has an idea. Most times in our incubator, we want people who have a tried and true initiative. Initiative, yes, or a business. But since I've been there, I think that I've been able to encourage to say, I don't care if it is just you are brand new to this. Come talk to us. And then you're not going to leave there without Either you're being connected to the place where you could go to start with your idea, 
or I'm going to give you maybe an assignment or something that I really want you to think about these five questions on your business. And then you can reconnect with me or someone else, but never to let anyone leave to say your idea is just dumb and crazy and go away. It is connecting them with other people who can help them on their journey. And even at Tech Town, I have people who don't even have a tech idea. They'll just call and say, can you connect me to someone who can help with something else? So, yeah, I didn't think about it that way. But that connection piece is so important because then it makes people that is what I believe shows people that you are inclusive because independent of there's diversity of ideas and diversity of thought. So no matter how diverse your idea is, you have someone at Tech Town who will listen to you and at least try to connect you to where you need to go. What kind of work are you doing now with Tech Town? Yep. So Tech Town called me up and said, hey, there's an issue. And the issue is there is this huge gap, which I think everyone knows, in technology. Uh, and especially in entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial side of technology. And in Detroit, we're seeing the lack of people of color and women who are stepping up to say they're high-tech founders. Those two very specific very characteristics, specific, yes. okay, who are not becoming founders of technology yeah. enterprises. Yeah. So they wanted to, say, they wanted me to come in and say, "Hey, can you help us to find more people, or how do we, or help us with a strategy to bridge that gap?" And uh, so that's what Tech Town called me in for. To, and, and that was one piece. But the other piece, and it's kind of evolved, is you have this entity that is amazing. So Tech Town does some amazing work. But sometimes when you're in it, the thick of it, you think everyone knows your work and they don't. So my thing was, yeah, we can get, we, we're going to, we will address this gender and racial gap in tech, but how do we start foundationally so that people who are diverse even know that you're here? And what did you do? And, and what do you do? Mm -hmm. So we were able to actually just reach out to diverse groups and okay. say, hey, diversity and inclusion has to be intentional and there has to be a focus. It can't be someone's part-time job. Well, and you have to be intentional in that you have to encourage it, right? You have to invite it in. Yes. You can't just open a door. You have to walk out that door and invite Come on diversity in. and inclusion in. Right. It's very specific and mm -hmm. intentional. Yeah. And I mean, even things like um, if you have something as simple as you have open office hours and your open office hours are from 10 to 4. Well, when I was growing up, my mom had to work and my dad worked two jobs. So if they even had an idea, wanted to come to see you, they can't. Or they In, during that off. window of time. Yeah. So what if we just did it at, from six to nine? Mm -hmm. And what would that look like? And, right. Or how about we go into the neighborhoods and hold open office hours? Recently, we had a panel discussion and I found this, this, there was a guy named Dave Tarver. And I was at a startup weekend and we're sitting there. We're on a panel together. And I hear him say that. He worked for Bell Labs. So he's an engineer from Flint, worked for Bell Labs back in the 80s, sometime like that, preeminent technology entity. But then he quit and started a tech company in his basement with two other African-American engineers from Bell Labs. Twelve years later, they sold it for $30 million. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'm sitting there and I'm like, why doesn't the world know? This is how diversity and inclusion grows, because if you, as this African-American male, did this thing, if you were just to stand up and talk about it, then this is how you get attention from people because you did this. And not only did you do it, you're from Flint, $30 million, uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. And that was in the no, 80s. It's wonderful. And so we were able through Tech Town, uh, they gave me a forum to put on, um, I call it candid conversations. And we flew the other two founders into Detroit. And we, I traced them around from news station to radio station. They, they were like rock stars for two days. And then we had a huge panel at uh, Detroit Michigan Science Center where they just talked about their journey to a packed house. It was great. And from there, now you have people to say, I have an idea. Oh, well, come see me at Tech Town. <laughs> you are pioneering a whole part of the world that needs this kind of attention but isn't getting a lot. Yeah. There is this thing that I'm aware of called Sisters Code. Yes. That has, I believe, you as the founder. I am the founder. So, Marlon Williams, tell us about Sisters Code and how all of this has then led you to being a speaker for Microsoft. Microsoft. I know, right? So That's Sister, amazing. Sisters Code was founded on a whim. I was a speaker at Techonomy uh, a few years ago. Well, maybe three, three years ago. It was the first time in Detroit. 
And they were talking about education 2.0. Like, how do we educate Americans now? And I said, I'm going to start an organization where we teach women to code. And that's what we're going to do because it's so much um, emphasis on young children. Well, what about grown folk like me who know how to cook, clean, be married, take care of children? We know right. we already know we how to do We have different training, but we're hungry for this. We want to. Right. And so I stepped off the stage and I had a rush of people saying, what can we do to help? What are you doing? I'm like, and really Sisters Code started because of my journey. At the age of 25, I learned to code. And so that's why Sisters Code, I came up with Sisters Code. It was, how do we get more women to believe that they can do this? And how are you doing it? So we have uh, what we call a weekend website warrior program. And so it's two days. That's it. You learn CSS and HTML, which is not really coding, but it's exciting enough. It's easy enough, exciting. Gets them in the door. Yep. And then we hit them with JavaScript just a little bit to make them dangerous. And they've created this little website and the high fives are going. And I mean, we're, we have music on. Like it is a coding party. And so after two days, some women love it. Some are like, I don't know. But then they, they, at least they get to go on and do something different. We have one uh, young lady two years ago. She was a Zumba instructor. She came to us, and now she's a systems administrator, I think, at Blue Cross. Uh, I have one woman who was 62. She still helps us. And uh, she came in. Just, she didn't know what to do. So she, um, she actually took our class, and now she owns a small business making websites for churches. So. As, a, as a reinvention professional, mm -hmm. <laughs> why do you do what you do? Uh, it's all about empowerment. If, if, if anything, if I find myself doing anything and it's not helping to make someone better or push them out of their comfort zone or have them get out of their own way, I don't do it. Is so, that because you do it, it to yourself or is that because you, you do inherently know that growth only comes when we are out of our routine? I think both. I think that this, you know, life is short, but it's like, it could be such an amazing life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, I know for me, had I stayed in the status quo, man, I wouldn't be speaking at Microsoft. No. You know, well, I'm, and you're a young I'm woman. Wouldn't. So at what point are you having all these other awesome opportunities yeah. that go along with, you know, the, the number of steps you've already talked about that you've done? You, there's another 20 years of work that you're going to be doing. I mean, it's, it, you <laughs> yeah. know, it, it just doesn't end because you're not the kind of an individual that will ever retire. You're Probably just going to go from thing to thing to thing to thing. <laughs> yeah. But you're building upon something really cool, which is empowerment, diversity, inclusion. So I want to get into the core of you and, okay. and talk for a minute about what is it about you that allows you to do your work, one. And secondly, how do we help others who are equally inspired to do the same kind of work but don't know how? Or how to get started? Well, I know for sure. For sure. It's because when I started out my journey, just as a young child, there was a lack of self-esteem. My confidence was none. I did a lot to make a lot of people happy. Like, I wanted you just to see me and am I good enough? Am I okay? You know, so I would get the best grades. I was the best singer and speller. Both my parents are ministers, so I was the best in church. And I mean, just... <laughs> All this crazy. And then one day I just woke up and was like, I'm not even living my own life. Like, I don't want to do any of I'm pleasing this. everybody else and I'm not pleasing me. No. Initially, the first company I ever started was in high school or college. And it was called Center Stage Productions. And I just remembered this maybe a few months ago. And I wanted to be a public speaker. That was it. But when you're going to college and you're the first one in your family to go, because my parents didn't go, mm -hmm. that's not going to fly. And so I'm like, well, I think I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be, but it was to make them happy. Sure. And now all these young late these years later, I get to travel the world and speak like, this is what I was supposed to do. And so I look back on that and I'm like, you know what? There are a lot of things that I gave up trying to please other people or I thought maybe were too hard. So how did you so. make the transition from pleasing others to really understanding what core contribution you could make to others? I went through a divorce twice. I lost a lot financially. You know, I owned, in between all of this, I owned a very successful staffing company. And my life was just blowing up. I mean, it was like, it was huge. Right. And I still was just empty. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't even like that. I don't like any of this. You haven't figured out your core yet. So I walked away. I, I literally, which is 
why one of the divorces happened. I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I just kind of walked away and I took a, my girlfriend's call a life sabbatical. And I just was quiet and I read a lot. It was just, I needed to really awaken and say, what is this all about? How old were you when you did that? We're, we're hearing about how academics take sabbaticals mm-hmm. for the same reason. Yep. I, I honestly have never heard anybody say a life sabbatical, but it makes so much sense. But, I was in but, my 30s. In your 30s. <laughs> I was in my 30s. So you had 10 years of professional work, and then you had yeah. to kind of reload and say, okay, I got to really think this through. What do, what do I really want to do yeah. with my work? I was climbing a corporate ladder. Like, I'm at CompuWare. I mean, I am climbing. Oh, yeah. You're hugely yeah. successful. I was deputy CIO for the city of Detroit for uh, during Super Bowl. So I coordinated all of the technology behind the, what, with the help of a great team behind Super Bowl. So I'm like, I'm climbing. Then I have a successful staffing company. And I'm like, I don't like any of this. I was missing every one of my daughter's field trips. That was another thing. Like, yeah. like she was growing up. And I'm like, who yeah. is this child? And that. And by the way, said, she was doing the same thing to you. Yeah. Who is this woman who's supposed to be my mother? So I think it was like middle school. I was like, yep. And I remember I wrote down on a note and I said, I will never miss another field trip. So whatever that looks like, I'm not. So I just stopped and I went on field trips. So and- if you are going to be involved in the world of reinvention, the first really core principle is you have to be prepared to reinvent yourself. That's right. I mean, that's really one of the core key principles is you can't really lead a reinventive effort or reinventive ways of looking at coding or in diversity or inclusion if first you weren't ready to say, I have to own this and yeah. I have to be first. Yes. And, 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 and the ability to share my truths with people because – you know, we all look on the exterior and you think everybody is just, you know, they haven't been through what you've been through. And I'm like, no, listen, girl, <laughs> I have lost a lot and done this and this wasn't right. And, you know, so you can do the same thing for sure. My daughter, she was at Cast Tech, amazing student, and she went through Kim Bio because she was going to be a doctor. I know she didn't want to. So her senior year, she's like, mommy, I really, really think broadcast journalism is it for me. And I was so excited that she finally got to that point because I'm like, there's no way you're going to go to college and go to and be in pre-med. You don't want to be, but you're doing that because I know you think that it would make me happy. So now she's a freshman broadcaster. Now, that sounds strangely familiar to it the was, thing you were talking yeah, about that you were doing. I knew exactly. So if, had she told me she wanted to go into pre-med in college, I told her, no, no, you don't. <laughs> and she didn't. And so now she is happy and flourishing. And I'm like, you get to live your life and do what you want to do. If someone who's listening to this podcast, who is very inspired by you, wants mm-hmm. to get a hold of you, yes, how do they do that? So I will tell anyone who is interested in technology, email me directly. Just email me. And your email is? That is Marlin, like the fish, M-A-R-L-I-N, at techtowndetroit.org. And I do that because, and some people are like, oh my God, you know, when you go out and do these things, you're going to get a million emails. I want all of them um, because someone could have that next big idea or someone just may need some encouragement to say, okay, your idea may not work, but... <laughs> these are some things maybe you can do differently or we'll re- refer you to somewhere else, someone else. So, If you had to give one bit of advice mm-hmm. to someone who's contemplating the journey of reinvention, either personally or professionally, what is that one bit of advice? Well, I guess I'll say, um, I always say, what is the worst case scenario? Ask yourself, what is the worst case scenario? If it is not death, then you're probably going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, you'll be fine. Just do it. This is just awesome. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Jody, for many of us, the uh, taking a life sabbatical is a kind of a, a term we've never heard before. But as we're learning in our November podcasts, We're all following kind of this traditional benchmarking, goal setting, and how the world views success or not, that maybe we need to take a step back and really redefine what what success really is and, and, and what our journey needs to be about. Marlon brings home, if you're not finding value in what you do, regardless of the paradigm you work within, it's time to take a sabbatical. It's time to take a breath. It's time to create some space and be more intentional about where you push your energy moving forward. There's the place that I, you, you, you framed it so nice that life is life. Whether mm-hmm. it's our professional or our personal time, it's our life. Yep. We, we have a life and we do certain things in our life. And the concept of a life sabbatical, which is now starting to emerge in a more 
uh, everyday kind of occurrence as opposed to where we typically heard about sabbatical, which is kind of at the university mm-hmm. professor type level, uh, is actually, I think, intended to help us as we journey through this thing called life with a component being professional, a component being personal, and all of those things changing and flowing and adjusting on a real-time basis. You can't separate them. They all interconnect. Yet, every once in a while, we have to take a step back, don't we? Yeah, and and I think when when people are stepping back and then using that as the launch point for what's next— yeah. They are trying to find alignment at that point. So deciding what is it that lights me up? What is it that I have a unique knowledge about, passion for, interest in, talent, skills, you know, a, just a God-given ability to do? And what what kind of an impact do I want to have with that? And in what settings do I find I am my best self? And how can I create more opportunities to do what I'm good at and what I love in a setting where I'm my best self and what can be the product of that. And in Marlon's case, she's got several things going. And what I love about her story is her position at Tech Town allows her to give that kind of inspiration and at and times permission to other entrepreneurs. Yes. She gives out her personal yes. email. You know, come yes. see me, come talk to me. I encourages see, it. I want to read every one of those emails. And even if my critique to you is, you know, this idea is not fully formed yet, but here's what you can do next and here's who you can talk to. It's never a no, it's a keep going. Yes. And she get, she has an opportunity now, you know, she said, I thought I was going to go into pre-med because I thought that's what my parents wanted, but I wanted to be a public speaker, you know, and how do you sell that? And now she gets to do a ton of public speaking and the message that she spreads is one that helps other entrepreneurs spread their wings. I think we're really learning this thing called a sabbatical helps us balance the journey of life. And we get away from what is the work-life balance to what is the life balance and how do we use a thing like a sabbatical, which Marlon has talked about, in a way that helps us apply this. But Jody, I want to tell you, you did the same thing as you kicked up the month of November when you said you took a sabbatical from We Invent yeah. to take a step back to let the next phase of We Invent come to you. And when you created that space... You created the ability for it to fill with the things that you needed. So instead of working at finding those things, it found you, and then you were ready to go into the next phase. You could high energy with high energy energy. and and a new sense of purpose. That had you just slogged through the day by day, you would have not been in the same place. In a three or a five year time period, you will have far exceeded what you accomplished with that project. Because you take periodic sabbaticals to step back and take a rest and really kind of rethink the why you're doing things. Mm -hmm. And when you are a reinvention leader, you have to take that more long-term view. Get away from the short-term, what are you doing today? I want to see that progress on a five-year timeline. And if you need to take a couple of sabbaticals in there in order to really be able to have dramatic growth, fueled by a rest phase, a sabbatical, where you can kind of reinvent and, and, and really re, reevaluate. I give a lot of credit to those individuals who have the courage to implement those because, J- Jody, we know society doesn't encourage mm-hmm. us to do that. Yeah. Busy and productive seem to be synonymous nowadays. And I can be busy doing a whole lot of things, but if I'm not moving any of them forward, then I'm not productive, I'm not effective, there's no value. So busy for the sake of busy is what a lot of society is focused on, and it's not necessarily where the biggest bang comes from. Marlon is teaching us a concept that we are, it's emerging, and we're going to hear more about it as time goes on. I really think it's something for all of us to think about its true value. So if we're ready for a change, make it a change that lasts. Make it pure reinvention. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new podcasts are up by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at pureinvention.com.